May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So I wonder if you have ever had this experience, where it's a morning that you just don't want to get up and go to work or go to school. You just do not want to wake up. And that alarm clock goes off, and you get up and you go throughout your morning routine, whatever that is, your exercise, your breakfast, you go through it all, you get through your morning commute, you get where you want to be, you sit down at your desk, and then you hear, bonk, 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 and you were dreaming. <laughs> you actually have to get up and do it all over again. You were just dreaming that you got ready. I don't know if you've had that experience before, but I have. <laughs> and it makes for the longest morning of your life, doesn't it? <laughs> the longest. I want to tell you a story about the longest morning of my life to date. Many of you know that I have four lovely, raucous, wonderful boys. And so this longest morning of my life took place not long after the fourth one came. He was still a little one. And so you all know if you've ever had an infant in your house, it can make for some interesting mornings, right? So <clears throat> we get up. The oldest one, I think he's only first grade, kindergarten, first grade, something like that. And school starts early for those little kindergarten bodies. And so we get them up and we're getting them ready and you go through the whole thing. You got the breakfast, you got the clothes, you got the shoes, where's the book bag? Got to get them out the door. Boom, boom, boom. Whew. Number one, done. Whoops, baby's up, run upstairs, grab the baby. Got to change the diaper, get the feeding started. He's waking up raging hungry, right? Get that one going. And the next thing you know, boom, boom, I got toddlers, I got twins in the middle. So the toddlers are up, boom, boom, scamper, 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 run, 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 grab the clothes, grab the shoes, not one, two, three, but four shoes and four pairs of socks. Get the breakfast out. What? It's the wrong color bowl? <laughs> Switch the bowl. Bowls and spoons matching, boom, milk, ready to go, all right, packed up, got your lunch, ready to go, off to preschool. Wait, boys, for me on the porch, please. Get the baby. Baby's in the car seat. Come on, baby, eat, eat, eat. Feeding the baby, feeding the baby, right? Like, poor thing's going to have heartburn. Got to get that baby out the door and get to feed him. As soon as you get ready to go, oh, wait a minute, back upstairs, change the diaper again, head outside. We're, we're going now. We're cooking with gas, we're ready to roll. Except one thing had changed, just one thing. The day before, we had had the sprinkler guy out to visit. And, and he was so helpful. He set up the sprinkler so that it would automatically turn on every morning. So helpful, that sprinkler guy. So I walk outside, you want to know what I find? It is the most fun morning of life for the toddlers. They are going crazy, running back and forth, full backpacks, lunch boxes, everything, in the sprinkler, head to toe, mud, soaking wet to the bone. And even, I mean, even their lunch boxes were wet all the way to the inside. Their sandwiches were soaking wet. I swear, how long did it take that baby to eat that baby food? Like, yeah, that felt like it was gone forever. And that moment, I felt like, bonk, bonk, bonk. <laughs> Get up, do it all over again. Get back to the shower, scrub them all down, clothes and off and on our way. And I'll be honest with you, I'm no angel. <laughs> That morning was a little bit of a hard and trying morning. And I'll say this, I handled it in such a way that those boys have never tried that again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no angel. <laughs> okay, but, um, you know, we got through it. And there was a part of me that kind of thought, what were you thinking? And I know many of you have those moments in your lives where you're going through something, you're thinking, what were you thinking? And we have one of those moments in our scripture for today, our Acts text. Peter goes off and he has gone up to Joppa. And he has preached the good news to some folks who are very different from the disciples in Jerusalem. 
And he has preached the good news and baptized them. And the disciples come back and they're like, Peter, what were you thinking? What were you doing? And so it's kind of an interesting sort of really moment, Peter? Come on now. Really? All the way up there? And I read this story, and I'm sure a lot of you, when you hear that story, you kind of think, really? Look at the picture on the front of your bulletin, if you have it. It's a stained glass window that depicts this actual story. And there it is. There's a sheet descending from the sky. And it's got all kinds of animals on it. And it shows Peter having his vision of these animals descending from the sky. And then he gets this news that God wants him to go to these other people. And I kind of think, really? Really? It's kind of weird, isn't it? This whole visions and trances and things. Well, when you take a look at this chapter 11 that is in our lectionary today, the little section we get in our lectionary, actually a large section we get in our lectionary today, is just a synopsis of a much more fleshed out full story that we get in chapter 10. And in chapter 10, we get to meet a whole full cast of characters. This story is about Peter and Cornelius. And Cornelius is a Roman centurion, it says of the Italian legion, who lives up north. And it was a little unusual and notable because this Roman centurion was a godly man. His household prayed and gave alms, and he was known to run his household in a godly way. But you know, he was a centurion, which meant that he didn't keep all those same dietary laws and restrictions. Holiness in his house didn't look like what holiness looked like in Peter's world. It was different. And so this centurion has this vision and an angel comes to him. And the angel tells him, go out to Joppa and go find this man named Peter and bring him back. And he'll tell you what's what. He'll teach you. And then meanwhile, Peter has been, well, the scripture says, about noon the next day they were on their journey and approaching the city. And Peter went up on the roof to pray and he became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. So while it was being prepared, he fell into this trance. And in this trance, he saw this big sheet and every kind of animal, all the animals that were considered unclean. And God said, kill and eat, Peter. And Peter said, I, I don't do that. We don't do that. But God told him to three times. And Peter was just trying to understand what this trance means when the messengers arrive and they say, a centurion named Cornelius wants to talk to you. Aha. So Peter's vision ultimately teaches him that those distinctions that he thought were so important between, between the clean and the unclean and the sacred and the profane, they don't matter. They don't matter in God's new post-resurrection economy of love. Those distinctions were not important. So I can get behind that. I can get behind that sort of thinking and that reason for this passage in, being in there. And at the same moment, it still seems a little odd to me. This whole stuff about trances and visions and angels and descending sheets and all that sort of stuff. So I just kept coming back to this verse. Did you hear it? Peter went up on the roof to pray, and he became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. And I realized, hey, wait a minute, that's where I am. I'm too busy making supper to go up on the roof and have trance time with Peter. I'm too busy making sure those needs are met. I'm too busy headed out there finding all four of those shoes or whatever needs to be done and headed out there. And I imagine a lot of you are like that too. Your days are filled with lots and lots of tasks that care for and give love to the people around you. You've got to get where you need to go. You've got to provide for those folks who need you. You've got to get supper on the table. I mean, really, who has time to go have trances with Peter? <laughs> well, it's a really, really good news that we don't need trances or visions or great conversion experiences to experience this radical love that Jesus has offered. 
that God's love through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ unites us to all beings and to one another. To experience the real depth and breadth and life-giving love that knows no boundaries. Because the truth is, every single time we stretch just a little bit outside of our own boundaries and love someone else with the full compassion and engagement that we would want extended to ourselves, that is when we journey deeper into God's love. See, Peter had experienced this up close with Jesus and the disciples. And my guess is those servants and the cooks and the messengers and the whole household of people, the dozens and dozens of people in this story who didn't receive great visions, that wasn't their lesson to learn, those great visions. Many of them were already experiencing a daily reality that required them to push beyond their own personal needs and serve and meet the needs of others. I don't know what their attitude was like, but I do know that any time we offer interpersonal love, daily acts of devotion and service, that stretch out of ourselves and arc towards the spiritual growth of another human being, that is what the spiritual enterprise is all about. It's about stopping and really looking at that person, that whole being or beings in front of you, and realizing they don't need chastising, they don't need a lecture, they know they screwed up. They just need some dry clothes and maybe some shoes that aren't muddy. And let's continue on. A life in this service of moment by moment by moment giving love, caring for God's children, it begins with those closest to us, doesn't it? It begins in our own families. And it extends wider and wider and wider until it deepens in us a capacity for empathy. And then we start to see those divisions that we've made, those divisions we've made in our families, in our hearts, in our neighborhoods, in our towns, those divisions that we see on the daily news and we scratch our heads, those divisions that we have constructed, those do not matter to God. A life of Christian spiritual service reaches out across those boundaries. And Jesus came just so that we might love one another. And we know that they will, they know we, they will know we are his disciples by our love. Amen.